What I saw from this point is something that I, I have very difficult time describing, but I will do my best. Immediately, I notice some movement along the side of the entrance on both sides. As I look at it, I notice that there are figures, shadow figures that come in and now line the entire perimeter of the room. I'm like, what the hell? I've never seen anything like this. As I'm watching this happen, and this is with my physical eyes now, okay? This is in my mind. Good evening, folks, and welcome to Alien Addict. Now, I want to say a massive, massive, massive thank you to you all. Uh, 5,000 subscribers hit. Um, people are sharing the videos. People are hitting the thumbs up. I want to say a huge thank you to the Reddit users as well, because... I've seen that my my shares, most of them are coming from Reddit, and I'm not even on Reddit. So, I think I did make a Reddit account once. I'm going to revive it and uh, see what you guys are putting. But anyway, thank you so much. It means the world to me. I know it's been a while since the last one, but yeah, I've been working long hours. And, um, yeah, making time to do the edits arranging interviews there's more interviews to come by the way and uh, some very special ones on the way uh, but yeah thank you so much guys 5000 hit uh, the only way is up and uh, yeah keep sharing people and check the patreon page out uh, 13 patrons now um, fine specimen of people on there as well beautiful people great little community it's growing and yes it, it puts a little bit of money my way so it helps the channel out because the money for Patreon just is it's just there to support the channel because I do have a day job. But um, yeah, the channel is growing people. At some point, I will have my own little alien den and, you know, may, maybe I'll, you know, fly, um, what's his name? Bob Lazar over and interview him in my garage with Corbell. Yeah, one can dream. But anyway, enjoy the show. This is Dark, Dark Hour Paranormal. That's capital D, capital H. All one word, paranormal. Then paranormal separate. Uh, but yeah, enjoy it. He's a fine specimen of a fellow. Beautiful man. And uh, interesting. We do talk a little bit about ufology as well, so we don't leave that out of it. But um, I'm starting to delve a little bit into the paranormal. I think you've got to, if you're going to look at a... The uh, over the other side of things, you know. Bob Bob Lazar in the garage, yeah. Michael, welcome to Alien Addict, my friend. It's good to have you, otherwise known as Dark Hour Paranormal. How are you on this fine evening? Or is it daytime doing, there? <laughs> I was going to say I'm doing quite well. The sun is shining. I'm watching my kids play on the beach right now. Ollie, thank you very much for having me on uh, your show. I have been watching your episodes, and you're fantastic at what you do, uh, and it's an honor to be here, man. Thank you for having I me. I really appreciate that, my friend. I mean, the main reason, uh, and I've seen your name pop up on, on lots of channels, people people know you, you know, and you've not been around for long. So I thought, who is this guy? Who is this Michael? I didn't know you as Michael, then. I just knew you as Dark Hour Paranormal. So I'm typing in Dark Hour Paranormal, and it's all one word. It's Dark Hour, par dark hour then Paranormal. Yes, um, yes. You know, I'm, just, I'm thinking, this guy's he's doing some good stuff. But it's weird because recently I've started to delve a little bit more into the paranormal, which is why I wanted to get you on. So can you tell us a bit about your channel and, uh, you know, why are you, why you doing the channel in the first place? Sure. Uh, I started doing Dark Hour Paranormal as a YouTube channel back in May. So it hasn't been very long. And uh, as you and I were discussing earlier, Ali, it's about timing. Uh, I've wanted to do this sort of thing for a very long time. I've worked in radio, uh, but never had the chance to really express the side of the paranormal uh, and everything that's un encompassed underneath that umbrella. And so when I was doing some broadcasts on Spoon, which is a broadcasting application, which I'll be honest with you, uh, I had success with in respect to a following, but the technology had a bit of catching up to do. A friend of mine, Rick from Rick's Realm, had mentioned, well, I have a show on YouTube. I've been doing it for several, four, five, six months, and uh, it's a great time, man. You should try doing it. Bring your stuff in, in that respect. 
So uh, after a little bit of hesitation and some gentle nudging, I finally looked into it and established Dark Hour Paranormal as a YouTube channel. And within the first couple shows, it was mainly Rick and myself kind of bantering back and forth about the paranormal and whatever you know broad subjects we wanted to bring up. Uh, at the same time, we did have a couple people actually from uh, the UK call in and uh, be able to express some of their investigational findings and so forth. So it started there, and very quickly, within I think the third, possibly the fourth show, I realized that the trajectory the channel was taking was absolutely focused around interviews, and I really wanted to get to know other people's perspectives. Now, one of the, the broader visions I've had for Dark Hour Paranormal as a channel is that, you know, you and I will sit down and we can talk to some of these great guys from TTSA or MUFON, you know, I'm going to use uh, those two as an example. Just big names, okay? Great guys might be a little bit uh, of a stretch. But that being said, I know they're good people. I'm I love that. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> I'm just saying what we're all thinking. It's okay. Um, that being said, I realize that it's important to interview those people, but it's also very important to interview people who aren't really out in the public eye or who have not had a chance to express themselves because of the experiences they've had or uh, the social... Uh, adversity they may face as a result of coming out so the layman the common person who's having these extraordinary experiences dealing with the paranormal dealing with uh you know astral topics uh dealing with ets and so forth i think their voice is just as important as you know somebody who is out in the public eye and has been known to do this stuff for a very long time so that's what i wanted to bring to dark hour paranormal and that's that's the overall vision for the channel i think I find that really interesting the, the, because you're going down the whole route of interviewing. Now, when I first started out, it was just me ranting and debunking and all sorts of nonsense, uh, which I still do a little bit of that, but I'm mainly doing a lot of interviews now. But how do you vet it? How do you vet the people that you're interviewing? A lot of times, I will just take a chance. I'll reach out. And say, if it happens, it happens. And I'll be honest with you, I'd say about 70 to 75% of the time I get a response that's positive about coming on the show. And there have been many times where I've opened up my phone and looked at my email. I'm like, oh, holy shit. Okay. They said yes. You know, so, I mean, it would get me really excited and push me to reach out further. I've talked to um, representatives for Neil Donald Walsh. I've, I've reached out to Eckhart Tolle. Uh, you know, some of the bigger names, Dronvalo Melchizedek, uh, you guys might recognize. These names that have been around for a very long time. Um, if they come back, I mean, they have walls uh, to get through before you actually get to that person. If they come back, that's great. I have a feeling a lot of those kind of folks will probably pop up within a year or so, giving me the thumbs up or the thumbs down. Uh, but it's really just a matter of reaching out. And then, of course, I've had people on my show that have been in my past. Uh, there have been a couple women that I've brought on that I've had relationships when I was in my early 20s, but we were always spiritually inclined. And just, again, on a whim, I just had this feeling like, reach out to this person. I'm like, man, I... I don't even know where they are. Look on Facebook. All right, fine. Just, oh, there they are. Contact them. All right. Oh, well, what do I say? Hey, how you doing? Want to come on the show? I've seen you've been doing this lately. You know, okay. So I start there. And sure enough, uh, I get an overwhelming positive response from the majority of people that I contact. So your channel's growing quite fast. You know, it's only been going a few months now. Um, so you, at some point, you're going to get, like, your email uh, is going to start and getting filled up so, so i i take a risk i i know i do that when i interview somebody that just says they want to come on the show they want to tell their story um so have you have you taken any risks like that and just had somebody on that you don't know no wow. uh, i always have a good half hour to hour and a half to two hour conversation with the people before coming on with the exception of michael horn who I corresponded through emails uh, for quite some months before we came on. And that was more of a dissemination of information and, and things like that, you know, educating me on what he was doing and I was checking out stuff and responding and so forth. Other than that, I'll always screen somebody before uh, inviting them on the show. I might approach them with the prospect of you know that being a possibility, but I want to talk to you. I want to get to know you first. I want to see if you're A, a fit for the show, and B, if, if you're really 
you know, who you say you are. Some of these people say, well, I'm a medium or I work with energy and I do it as a professional career. And then I start talking to them and I'm like, well, yeah, maybe you do, but I don't feel you've reached the depth of what it really is and maybe what it's really all about. I don't think you're, I don't, I don't, let me put it this way. You have to resonate with somebody too, okay, on a level that so you say, okay, I feel comfortable with this person presenting this particular information. And I'll never shut somebody out uh, if they're uh, proposing a different viewpoint. It's a matter of experience, I guess is what I want to say. Do you have the experience? What is that experience and how? what does it entail? Um, I want to see that human side of you. Yeah, you know what I'm saying, though, when somebody sends an email to you, I've got, and they've got this amazing story. But then when you speak to him in person, you think, this guy was bullshitting me. But now now it's too late because <laughs> I've opened well, Pandora's box. I'm now <laughs> doing an interview. <laughs> See, I, I, I'm very careful with that. I'm very careful with that because you will, you can get yourself into trouble in that way. And then what happens then? You're not doing a service to yourself or the show. You're not doing a service to the guests and the way they think they're being presented. And there's all this uncertainty surrounding it. So that's why I say, okay, listen. Okay, so for example, somebody emails me, has this crazy story. I say, great, let me talk to you either on the phone, let's talk through uh, Messenger or something like that where we can sit and have a conversation as if maybe we were going through questions on the show. And, and let me feel you out because if it gets to a point where I say, okay, this, this guy's bullshitting me, this isn't working or it doesn't fall in line, you know, in, in one way or another, I say, hey, listen, thank you very much uh, for your time. I appreciate it. I will consider uh, reaching out to you. We'll see how this fits in the future. If that works, great. If not, man, listen, I appreciate you contacting me. We'll see what we can do later on. And I'll leave it there, you know, because you don't want to get yourself caught in that situation where you start a show and you're like, oh, God, this is this is going to suck, man. Uh, God, what, what can I do already to dock this up? You haven't even gone live yet. You don't want to get into that point, you know. I'm, I'm waiting for the person that comes on that tells me they're an alien. And I'm just kidding. <laughs> <yeah. laughs> the show must go on. And that's what it will. That's what will happen. Absolutely. But that person might regret coming on. <laughs> well, you know what? <laughs> You're doing your job then. And if you listen to, uh, you know, Coast to Coast AM, which I started on in, in the late 80s, um, there have been many times, even on Space Out Radio, there have been many guests where, you know, you could see that, that Dave or you could hear that Art was really interested in what they were saying, but they're like, okay, that's interesting. You know, you can tell that there's, there's something maybe not um, grounded about the guest or what they're saying, but yet it's something that they believe in. And so my job as a host, as I believe it is most of our job, is to present the information as it is presented to us. Uh, yeah. You will find my bias in there a little bit because of my experiences, and this is something I've outwardly expressed before. But by and large, I want to just present that information. I'll never judge anybody that comes on the show. You want to come over and tell me that you've done X, Y, and Z, and you've seen this planet, and you've been through this meditation. Great. That'll be on you, and that's what we're going to know you for. You know what I mean? But again, you don't want to get yourself into a situation where you can tell that somebody just blowing smoke up your ass to get the attention or, you know, possibly even worse to have a deleterious effect on what you're doing creatively so this brings me on to my next question what brings you to the paranormal what is what is triggering you to do this type of work because you could be doing anything you could be you know you've got a great voice for radio you've got a great voice for interviewing but you could be doing anything you could be talking about sports you know anything you <laughs> You interviewing actors, but you're doing paranormal. There must be a reason behind this, and this is what I'm interested in. Well, thank you for that, number one. And number two, this is the uh, heavy-hitting question, isn't it? Um, so myself, I got involved with this field in general when I was about 12 or 13. I was always aware of something more or outside the box, if you will, in terms of my life and what I was going through. As a kid, I, I had a difficult time academically. I was diagnosed with attention deficit disorder back when they called it that, uh, when I was 11. And from that point on, you know, I was medicated with Ritalin, Dexedrine, uh, a couple other test, you know, drugs that they had. So I already had this, this different perspective. I felt different than everybody else around me because there really wasn't anybody else in my school that was uh, undergoing this sort of treatment. And so I think that in that and then being, you know, bullied and stuff uh, 
you know, in, in grammar school and, and so forth, really kind of thickened my skin to perhaps having my own ideas and being able to stand up for those ideas. And once I started having thoughts of, uh, let's say, a spiritual nature, uh, my family was very supportive. Both my parents are spiritual individuals. My mother, I think, a little bit more so in certain respects. Uh, but I had that support. And though I felt different in respect that I was looking beyond and saying, well, what's the meaning of life at the age of 12? And, you know, sitting through an entire semester of science class where the teacher would just let me play around with objects I had in front of me because I was trying to disprove the existence of time instead of following the curriculum. You know, this is stuff that normal kids weren't doing in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So, you know, I garnered the attention back then is is sort of being interested in things nobody really understood. Um, I remember there was a very poignant moment for me when I was 13, the early years of 13. I'm sorry, the early months of 13 years of age. And I just had this pressing question that we all have. What is this about? What's the meaning of life? Forget about every other question. What's the meaning of life? And I would send this out there and I would think about it all the time. Like, what is it? What is it? What is it? And one day I actually got an answer back the way that I would say it. Okay. In my head, I heard it wasn't my voice. It said, the point of life is to just be. And I said, wait a minute. That's, that's it. But that means, and I started rolling around in my head what that meant to me. And what I got from that was that the point of life is to experience. It doesn't matter what the experience is. The preference comes from the mind and or the ego if there is a separation. Uh, but the point is to just have the experience. So I started there and I brought it to my mother. I said, Ma, you know, I've been thinking about this lately and this is this is what I, I've come up with. And she looked at me, she goes, okay. Okay. I'm going to talk to somebody and uh, I'll come back to you about this. You know, okay. I thought that was a little odd. Uh, so she called a friend of hers who is a clairvoyant. Well, was a clairvoyant. She's no longer with us. But uh, she said, I want you to come for your first reading with this woman. Her name was Joyce. I said, okay, that's interesting. And I had known that she had gone to readings. Uh, her and my father had been visiting somebody uh, for many years prior to my birth even uh, who had helped guide them along the way. And this, this woman was very, very, very connected to spirit. And she would, back then in the 70s, she wouldn't just talk about spiritual phenomenon. She'd talk about manifesting abundance. She'd talk about the ETs. She'd talk about future uh, events happening on the planet. She's very, very... Uh, visionary individual so this person she took me to my mother uh this woman joyce i sat down and normally you're not allowed to be read before the age of 18 and that's because a i was lot gonna of very impression. I, I yes. was actually gonna yeah so i was a special case in that respect uh that i was allowed to have this reading and the reason that she did it she said that she felt that i was ready for it at that age, I didn't really know what that meant, but I was very much open because I wanted answers. And I mean, I'm just getting into adolescence here. I've got lots of questions about life. And now I'm digging right into the core of, you know, what perhaps connects us all in the respect of energy and so forth. So I go to this reading and, you know, not surprisingly, she looks at me and she's like, oh, you're a very old soul. You've been around for a very long time. This and that. And the other thing I said, OK, yeah, OK, that, that resonates with me. Then she looks at me. She goes, but you're also an energy healer. You're a healer. So well, what does that mean? She goes. You have the ability, if you choose to, to use energy to help heal situations, people, animals, and so forth. I said, well, that's, that's curious. I'd like to learn more. She said, well, I'm going to put you in touch with somebody. Come down to this gathering we have in Willimantic, Connecticut. Uh, we gather about five, six, seven people a night, and we're all interested in working with energy. This is before I knew about the modality that is known as Reiki. Uh, it's got a name these days, and there's many divisions of it underneath that. There's Yusui Reiki and so forth, lots of different modalities. But we weren't really concerned about the words or the symbols. We were concerned with just the intuitive channeling of energy. So I went to this church, uh, if you want to call it that. Yeah, I, get, I think today it's a church. And I met this guy named Norman. Now, I walked into the building, and he kind of shuffled over to me. Like, something was up with his leg. It wasn't bending right. And I'm looking at him, and he approaches me, and he's very friendly, very warm, very big aura, very big energy. He says, hey, how you doing? Hey, come come sit down. I want to talk to you. I said, all right. So we sit down, and he's, again, talking to me. I'm 13, 12, 13 years of age. And uh, he goes, 
so I understand that you want to learn about energy. I said, yes. So he goes through and he tells me his experience. Uh, long story short, this guy started working with energy some years ago, was in an incredibly bad car accident and broke nearly every bone in his body, was in a body cast for a very long time. And as he was in this, continued to work with energy with the idea of healing himself. Well, doctor told him that he'd never walk again. And here he was walking up to me. Doctors told him he'd never be able to do anything for himself in terms of uh, self-maintenance. Here he was, a perfectly functional individual of society. Uh, and he swore by this energy. So he started me off by doing a little trick where you rub your hands together, you feel the friction, you feel a little heat that's physical. You hold them about yay so far apart. Now, in doing this and keeping them still, you'll feel that heat, that energy, that friction that you've just you know, brought up. But at the same time, if you push down a little bit, you're going to feel the slight odd resistance okay and as you do that you can actually pull it and get it to move from side to side so now you start feeling this vibration as you start getting aware of this particular phenomenon happening you can then control the speed of the vibration and at this point i was captured i was like holy shit what is going on here and he's showing me all these things right off the bat he says this is energy that's all around you you can use it for healing you can use it for uh remote purposes but this is energy that you can use and it's around every single one of us we all have the ability to use it so from there uh, i really delved headfirst uh into this realm i was very interested again in the paranormal and stuff alongside of the energy but it really played into it and this is where my understanding of energy began um i don't know if i i'm, I'm okay so yeah no, so I'm, I'm, I'm getting so there i'm getting right go ahead are, are you still are you still practicing in this healing yes yes um i do it when i'm called to do it somebody will come to me i'll feel guided to offer it um but it's usually a special case uh and like i said I have to, I, i'm usually sort of guided to it it takes a lot out of you to undergo something like that and to do it consistently uh will make you clearer and make you stronger as a channel but it takes a lot out of you and you have so you to be don't very do grounded it as like a business or anything like that no Nope. I never actually charge for any of my, my services, even when I used to read uh, and channel uh, back in college and after I got out of college and, and do Reiki sessions. I never charge for anything. And yes, I understand there should be an ener energy exchange in some respects. Uh, for me, it's never been an issue. I've just wanted to put that out there. I've wanted to give somebody that, that ability to heal or you know guide them in some respect. I never wanted to keep it for myself. And have you had some success stories for, on the back of this? Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Um, I'll give you two, actually. So the first one came, <coughs> excuse me, when I was uh, first starting into this. Um, I think I was 14. I was at this, this uh, Willimantic place. Okay. And this woman came in and we used to practice on each other, you know, playing with the energy. It was just, it was a very friendly sort of environment. And anybody who came in and wanted to give it a shot could. And this woman sat down on the, the chair, we'd set up four or five chairs for people who were going to receive, and then there would be people selected to uh, provide the energy or you know channel the energy. Uh, again, very old woman, had very difficult time getting to the chair, had somebody helping her, and I'm thinking, okay, this is great. You know, I'm going to be able to give some healing to somebody that visually, to me, really needs it. And again, I'm very young, 14 years old, 15 at very most. And uh, so I stand behind her, and what we would do, say this is a person's head, we'd always start around the neck area, and it doesn't always have to be a contact thing. It absolutely doesn't have to be unless you're guided to. And if you're guided to, you need to ask, seek permission before you do. And that's for many reasons, as you can very well imagine. So I started with her. And what happens when you get into this is that you kind of let yourself go. So I'm not thinking about um, pushing energy or where is the problem. I'm just, I'm going to do my own little meditation and let myself be guided. And you'll feel it. And you'll move if you choose to in this respect. So... I'm working again around her head, and all of a sudden, as I'm scanning the rest of her body, I'm immediately drawn to her right knee, okay? And so I'm starting to just push the energy there, and the energy's just flowing, flowing. I can feel it coursing through me, and it's going through my hands. My hands are heating up. There's tingling everywhere. And I put my hands on her knee, and the second I do, I feel like the knee shifts and cracks and crumples underneath my hands. And I was kind of like, I did like one of these real quick. But didn't break concentration it was just very odd because it literally felt like something had shifted and snapped and cracked like, the fuck okay so continued the session 
tried not to think too much about it, and continued out and finished off. At the end of the session, the woman looks at me. She goes, what did you do? And I said, what do you mean, what did I do? She said, what, what did you do to my knee? I said, I, I was just sending the energy as I was guided to do that. She says, my knee feels better than it has in, I don't remember how many years she told me. Let's say it was 10 years, okay? She said, better than it's, it's felt in 10 years. I've had a lot of issues with this knee. I'm like, really? Well, that's interesting. I felt it crumpling, crackling, sort of, I don't know, maybe realigning. I don't know. And she said, well, thank you very much. I, I feel fantastic. Uh, I came back the next week, and this woman was walking on her own. Uh, all the pain that she had, had described in her knee was gone. Uh, structurally, she, she felt it was stronger. And to me, that's really interesting. So that's a very physical manifestation of what this can do. Now, what about the emotional side? So the story is kind of funny. Many years ago, I used to work for a burger joint. And I was uh, an assistant general manager. And I had a bunch of these guys working underneath me that were between 17 and 26, let's say. So I had a grill cook come up to me, a very big hulking guy, dreadlocks, everything, kind of intimidating looking if you, if, you know, at first glance, but he's a sweetheart, real nice dude. Had, uh, I think, three kids at the time, and he was trying to make ends meet. So he came to me one day. He said, listen, you know, I'm having a lot of trouble emotionally. He's also a very good singer, by the way. Dude could bring me to tears just singing something a cappella, and that's not often that I experience something like that. Um, he says, you know, I've been having a lot of trouble lately, you know, this and the other thing, you know, a lot of emotional stuff going on. He's like, you know, I just I just wanted to you know, talk to somebody about it. I felt like I could talk to you about it. I, I said, okay. Destroy the house. Sorry. That's fine. You know, let's make sure uh, the couch is paid off. Anyway. <laughs> so he, uh, again, confided in me and it's like, you know, I just want to talk to somebody. I was like, listen. I know you don't know this, but I, I work with energy. If you're interested, I'll have you over and we can do a session. See what happens for you, dude. See if it works for you. If it doesn't, that's fine. If it does, then we hit something, you know? He was like, okay. And I explained it a little bit to him. He's like, okay. All right, I'll come over. I'll come over in a couple of days and we, we can try. I said, okay. So he did and came in and I sat him down in an armchair and I immediately started going to work the way I, I just described. So initially... As soon as I opened that door up, the energy was just like, <laughs> just, just immediately channels in. And it, what usually, I, in terms of a visual sense, I'll have like these smaller streams of energy that kind of run through like electrical currents. This is like somebody opened up a dam, and it was just like, boom, like this stuff was waiting for him to give the permission to come in. It was real healing energy, powerful. Uh, I mean, I was getting waves of it through my body, just letting it go through him. And as I'm doing this, I start walking around, and I was guided, I think, something down by his, his foot or whatever, and I would worked on that. And all of a sudden, in my mind's eye, I saw the Virgin Mary. I'm not a religious guy. Not in the slightest. I know all about that. You do look a bit just... like Jesus, though. <laughs> With a lip you, can imagine, <laughs> you can imagine. I've had a few comments like that. But, hey, there could be worse things, you know what I mean? Um, so I, I saw her come in, and here she was, uh, bright and surrounded by this this beautiful white light and she had her arms out like this uh sort of in the same way that i start my sessions and it was a very healing moment but i knew that she was there for him um and again i I'd never talked to him about religion i didn't know what he believed or anything like that uh so that was really powerful and as this was happening i'm working again around his body i don't think i actually ever touched him in the session he started bawling absolutely sobbing like this heavy releasing sob like somebody had died and it was just like I can feel. I get emotional here right now. I can feel it still. The energy that that session uh, uh, brought up for for him, and you know, the, as we went on, the crying became a little quieter, and it became it came to a lull, and it was more like an accepting sniffle, if that makes sense. And he fell asleep. I continue yeah, you mean the session. Like a, like a baby, when a baby's finished, it's crying. It's just got that like little. Correct. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And it was just this again, exactly like that. And uh, he fell asleep, which happens quite often during these sessions, believe it or not. And so, normal protocol. I finish up. I let him doze for as long as he likes. Um, before the session, I let him know if this is a possibility that he might, you know, get very relaxed. So take your time afterwards and what have you. So he emerged. 
from the armchair about 20 minutes later and just hugged me and thanked me and said, I, I don't know what just happened, but I feel very different, positively different. I said, well, that's awesome, man. You know, and he's like, I, I want to sit on this and I'll come back to you. And I had told him very briefly, you know, Virgin Mary had come in and uh, that was something that very much surprised him. Uh, but she was around him. She was in his energy. And today, when I look back, it makes a lot of sense considering the beautiful soul that he is. And um, so the next day, we work together in the morning. And he comes up to me as soon as we open. He says, listen, Michael, uh, I got a favor to ask you. I was like, what's that, man? He's like, listen, uh, if I disappear during the shift at any point today, just, 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 just man over for me. I, I got to go use the bathroom. I'm like, Okay, everything all right, man? You feeling okay? You sick? He's like, no, dude, uh, I'll be honest with you. I don't mean to be graphic, but uh, ever since last or yesterday when you when you did the session, uh, I've had the runs, bro, and it, it just it just won't stop. And I was like, oh, my God. Dude, I'm so sorry. This is my fault. I should have told you that is a possible byproduct of going through this energy because it will cleanse you physically as well. Some people experience flu-like symptoms for a couple days. Some people have a mild sniffle. Some people get sick like he did. Uh, poor guy. Poor guy. But ever since then, he has had a really strong positive outlook on life, which I think was something that was innate within him. And this sort of just broke away some blockages for him. Uh, I've been in touch with him. Quite late, truly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, this was about 10 years ago, maybe, maybe, uh, no, it was about 10, nine, 10 years ago. And he's, he's still doing really well from that one session. That was all he needed. Be honest. You, you slipped a couple of laxatives in his drink, didn't you? Well, I mean, you know, how many people are going to see this video? <laughs> <laughs> the, Look, uh, I thought they were Tums. He's the other guy said they were Tums. I thought it was funny. I kid. So, so these are all the, the, the good side i mean is this all you get do you get is are you got do you get complete the the good side of them because I, I hear so much about this dark side and you are dark side paranormal so have you experienced the dark side yes i actually am the one that sits between the two pillars uh she is a high priestess if you look at the tarot cards and this is the life that i've chosen here so i experience extremes on the positive end and I experience extremes on the negative end and it's been my job to make sense of that balance uh, between excuse me it's the thing about having long hair uh, it's been my job to find the balance between that and exist on that particular vibrational level it hasn't been easy uh, in terms of Reiki and healing energy I haven't had much of a negative experience other than you know what I just described it's more of a not so preferable experience to be feeling sick for a couple of days after a session. But in terms of the ghost hunting stuff and uh, going into the clairvoyance end of it in relation to that, I've had some very negative experiences uh, with spirit. Can we hear about that? Because that's what a lot of the people that will come on this channel will be wanting to hear about. Because Absolutely. people don't like to hear good stuff. <laughs> no. You yeah, wouldn't be no. like to hear about the, the scary ass stuff yeah no it, absolutely there's a draw to the negativity uh and i understand that first and foremost because that's that's one of the things that got me into uh hunting for ghosts if you will if you want to call it that uh prior to me actually getting into it back in 2008 2009 on a more active level i'll say you know i had experiences but excuse me <coughs> Allergies are killing me right now. Post-nasal drip is just rocking me. Sorry. Um, so I've had experiences prior to what I did in Dark Hour Paranormal as an investigational team. It was nothing like what I actually experienced in those times. There were there are three specific um, experiences that I had that were long-lasting, two connected with the ghost hunting and one on its own accord. Um I'll try to give those to you in an ordered fashion here. Okay, so when we first started the ghost hunting, we went to uh, places that we could get in touch with. And back then it was a little easier to do it because, you know, even though ghost hunting as a, um, an activity or as a profession was already well established and out there, 
we were still at a point where it hadn't really just reached its pinnacle. It was getting there, and within a year or so, it did hit its pinnacle. Um, but you know, we were still on the upswing in, in, in groups of people that you know were being taken seriously for what we were doing. And so, the first real tough experience we had uh, was at this place called Rutland Prison Camp, and this was in Rutland, Massachusetts. It's way in the middle of the woods, and the history of this place was that it was a work camp uh, in the earliest part of the century. Earlier part of the century, um, there had been a tuberculosis ward there. There had been uh, the same hospital used to treat children. Uh, with sickness and mental disabilities. Uh, the camp itself had a very interesting history, but I wouldn't necessarily call it sorted. That being said, there was plenty of room for uh, some sort of tumult to have taken place. Like the isolation booths that were still standing were literally, you couldn't even lay down in things. They were so small. And these you know, one little pockmark in the ceiling that would let in some sunlight and guys spent a lot of time in those isolation chambers. Um, but yeah, when I went there, the, the dozens of times that I had prior to this experience, it you know, wasn't that big of a deal. Like I'd walk around the property, I'd feel some things, I'd get, you know, a couple things here and there, maybe an EVP or something on the ghost box, but it wasn't really all that intense. So this one evening we decided we were filming a pilot because we had a television show slated for ACMI, which is out of Arlington in Massachusetts. Uh, we had already gone to classes for it. We, were, we had full authorization to use all their equipment that they had at this uh, university. And we were starting to film the pilot with Rutland. So I went there with Rick from Rick's Realm and another guy from my outfit named Chris. Uh, big hulking guy from New York. Hey, I'm from New York! You know what I mean? He was a big, tough guy. Didn't really believe in this stuff, but was fascinated by it. And I'd say that Rick was probably in the same vein at that time, too. So we get out there set up our cameras, and I start asking questions. And I think at this point in my ghost hunting career, I'm a little impatient, and I decided I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to poke some, some things here tonight. I'm going to provoke a little bit. Fuck it. Why not? You know what? I want some answers here. And that's not that I wanted answers or are you here or are you not. I wanted to experience something else. I wanted to feel that heaviness, that, that evil, so that I could compare it with what else I had experienced in life. I just felt like it was part of the natural spectrum of what you should you know, have a tangible idea about. Um, boy, was I wrong. But, you know, that being said, uh, we're in this root cellar. And, you know, the, you could tell it was a cold storage area back in those days where they would, you know, store lots of plants and grains and whatever they were taking in from the fields. And um, I started feeling kind of uh, light, dizzy, but still uh, I'm on the ground. And I'm going through the questions in the dark. You can only see a couple of lights that we have out. Chris is on my left. Rick is on my right. All of a sudden, I get knocked down. And I realize that Chris has fallen on top of me. And I, I grab him, and to my best of my ability and my shock, I try to lift him up. I'm like, bro, you okay, man? You all right? He's like, yeah, I just, all of a sudden, I didn't know where the ground was. I felt really dizzy, and I just, whoop, that was it. He fell down. He fell on top of me. I was like, wow, that's really strange. Uh... Actually, in a, in a following investigation, he caught me on the same tip, oddly enough. So it came full circle. But that was at first. I was like, that's really strange. Here's a big guy who, you know, obviously has his shit together. And, and he's, he's halfway passing out. What happened here? So we continue the investigation as, as I'm doing this. And I realize that I have a pain in my, my left hand. And I flip on my, my light and I, I turn the flashlight and I look down. And I used to smoke cigarettes back then. So I had my lighter in my hand, apparently intent on lighting at some point. But I didn't realize it was there. And I was holding it so hard, my hand was white. And there was this huge imprint in my hand. I'm like, that's really strange. I should feel that. But I don't feel right. And this is like my first realization that something wasn't right. Didn't dissuade me. Put the lighter back in my pocket. Continued asking questions, getting more and more aggressive. All of a sudden, in my mind's eye, I see a figure, big black hulking figure, about, uh, if I were to make an intelligible guess here, I'd say 9 to 12 feet tall. And all I can see are these two glowing red eyes. And from this entity, is it's screaming, What do you want? What are you doing? It was just full of rage. It was like it couldn't communicate any other way except through rage. Maybe he was just asking me, but it was, it was, just, it was just the manifestation of absolute rage. And I could feel this. And around him, 
was this feverish red light. Have you ever had a fever dream where you wake up like sick with the flu or something, yeah. but you caught it in the dream first? It is that sort of feeling like I'm in a twilight, but like there's a sickly red light around, and it just it makes me feel really weird. So I said, all right, guys, let's take a break. I'm going to go outside, smoke a cigarette. We'll come back in. So we do. And, uh... Oh, hang about you. So you've just seen a guy with red eyes screaming at you, and you say, you know, let's take a break and let's go out for a fag. Yeah, pretty so much. Cigarette. Because, got, if yeah. not, a, a fag's a different thing. No, no, thing. I know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> we call them fags, cigs. Yeah. Um, so you, so yeah, you went out for a cigarette to. after seeing a guy with red eyes. Mm-hmm. I had to stop it there because the feeling was so intense, and in my, in my chest it was like, it, my chest was doing like this. It was just getting tighter and tighter. And I'll be honest with you, I think that it might have scared me a little bit. But again, I saw this figure in my mind's eye, but it was behind me. So out there, I try to collect myself. I'm out there smoking a, a cigarette, and Rick's over here doing his thing. The other guy goes off to take a leak. And we kind of get back towards the, the tunnel. I'm like, all right, guys, you ready? We're going to go back in. We're going to keep going. And Rick looks at me and goes, no, we're, no, I'm not going back in there. He doesn't remember this, apparently. But uh, he goes, no, I'm not going back in there. I said, what do you mean we're not going? you're not going back in there? He's like... Didn't you hear that? I was like, hear what? He said, the footsteps. They came, they ran up from there and they went right into the root cellar. You didn't hear that? I was like, no, I didn't. Now, the significance of this is that when I went to Rutland, uh, I had an advisor who was very familiar with the area, had been in this paranormal field for far longer than I was alive. And he told me, you can go to Rutland, but don't go to where the tunnels are. Somebody at some point had pulled some stuff out of there using, you know, uh, dark energy and magic never were able to put it back but they it's still out there rolling around but you'll be okay as long as you go to the tunnels so where rick was pointing was the direction of the fucking tunnels and now he's telling me that this thing whatever it was had run into where we were and he wasn't going back in there i was like listen if nothing else we got to go back in there and get the equipment if you don't want to continue it i mean i I get it but dude this is where we're here to do and i started sounding like uh zach bagans you know yelling at nick groff or whatever (coughs) yelling at rick and so we go back in. One second. Did, did the yeah. other two guys, did Rick and, I forgot, Chris, was it Chris? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did they see the dark figure with red eyes? Neither of them expressed that they did. And I'm not surprised if they didn't, only because I'm, I'm very sensitive to this. And I was already working with, uh, had already worked with spirit and channeling. And, you know, I have, you know, people who pass on come to me and I'm, I'm able to recognize that i mean does it mean that they they couldn't no it doesn't but they tell me they but, didn't notice that but rick was spooked by something yes he was right. sorry michael yes. yeah carry on nope, just trying fine. to get it in my head the picture nope, feel free to jump in anytime bro believe me i can be uh quite long-winded here um that being said so we go back inside and i decide that we're gonna we're gonna keep doing this because i'm yelling at both of them now like this is what we're here to do guys the fuck come on you know don't don't be like this guys and uh, so we get back into it. Now, as soon as we do, the whole room just settles. And the air is incredibly still now. The roof cellar itself has one entrance. And through this entrance, there are some vines coming down, overgrowing. But you can see the city lights on the night sky. So anything coming in, you can see the, the shadow or the silhouette, I should say, of, of that individual walking in. What I saw from this point is something that I I have a very difficult time describing, but I will do my best. Immediately, I notice some movement along the side of the entrance on both sides. As I look at it, I notice that there are figures, shadow figures, that come in and now line the entire perimeter of the room. I'm like, what the hell? I've never seen anything like this. As I'm watching this happen, and this is with my physical eyes now, okay? This isn't my mind's eye. This is my physical eyes I'm seeing this. I'm seeing these little pops of light that look like uh, fireflies, but they're all different colors. Red, orange, green, white, blue, purple, you name it. Pop, 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 pop. I'm like, huh. Okay. Again, just experiencing this, going through this. As I'm watching this, again, this is all incredibly silent. So silent that you're looking at it and say, this is unnatural. I should be hearing something from the movement that I'm witnessing with my physical eye. But I, I didn't hear anything. It was actually the complete opposite of hearing something, if that makes sense. I see the fucking figure come in the door. And at this point, I'm at nine, ten feet tall, okay? I didn't see the eyes, but I saw the outline. It was just a head, this head, and shoulders that come down like this. And it walks in. And I... 
heard slash felt I am Legion. At that time, I had an idea what that meant, but I wasn't fully in tune that I am Legion is one of the <clears throat> more ancient organizations of uh, you know negativity in terms of the uh, that world. Um, a lot of these big ancient demonic entities will have others around him or her, whatever it is. Uh, acting in the same vein that, that that one is acting, same intentions. They're all connected, but there they're, they're many of them. And therefore, very difficult if they infest your home or if that one comes in to, to get rid of because they have all that power behind them. But I saw this with my naked eye, and at that point, I realized I, time did not exist. It didn't just cease to exist. It just, it just it was not a factor. And I was in a space that it just everything was just at a standstill. Well, I don't remember exactly how the investigation ended in the respect that I said, okay, guys, that's it, we're done. But there came a point where I said, okay, let's, let's wrap this up. And it wasn't very long after we had gotten back in there and I had seen what I'd seen. Something didn't feel right. So we packed up. I got in Chris's car. We were riding together and Rick was driving home. And before we got off the property, I turned to Chris. I was like, bro, I don't, I don't feel right. He goes, yeah, that was pretty crazy, man. I don't feel... I feel a little weird, too. I'm like, no. No. Bro, I don't fucking feel right. Something's not right. And he didn't know what I was talking about. It was the first investigation he had been on with us. But he was trying to be helpful and, you know, whatever. But I was like, all right, you know, go home. Drops me off. I get upstairs in my apartment. I'm like, shit, something still doesn't feel right. Like, it's something heavy. I felt unnerved. My solar plexus was alight with anxiety. I'm like, the hell? So, a couple days go by, I'm having a real difficult time sleeping. Don't know what it is, keep waking up, never feel like I actually fall asleep. Third, fourth night, I start having these vivid, vivid nightmares uh, where it, I'm just being held down, uh, I'm being tormented in some way. Um, I'm going through some sort of odd emotional pain while I'm, I'm dreaming. I don't know what it is. Even to this day, I can't put my finger on it, but it was very unsettling. And then the physical manifest uh, manifestations started to begin, which gave me feelings of dread. Uh, my temper was incredibly short. That could be a result of not sleeping, too. Uh, these en entities will try to weaken you in any way that they can. And uh, it, let's see, it was with me for about three months three months and it affected not only myself but other people around me too uh and i ended up having to face it the same way that i asked for it to come because the biggest thing i realized at that point was when it came and i realized it and i could talk to it I said you asked for me i'm here i said but i asked for you like last week when i was at the rutland camp he's like time doesn't work like that with us you call we come when we come what do you want and at that point, I'm like, well, I, I just want to know if you were there, man. You're there. All right. We're good. We're good. We're good, right? We're good? No. <laughs> it's not that easy because anything requested on the other side is honored. You may not so, realize it, but it, it is honored. So where did you, where did you say this? To, to, the, to the mirror or to you – know, I had to go into meditation. What situation were you in where you thought, you know what, I'm going to try and talk to whatever it is that's bothering me and – how did that did you see something or did you just hear something in your head? Uh, it was it was more like I realized I had to go into meditation and again in my third eye, in my mind's eye, this thing was already there. I was already constantly trying to keep it away from my mind's eye because it would just kind of hey, I'm right here, yep, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And I was again constantly trying to keep it away. So when I, I let that down for a minute and went whoop right back around, because it still had its purpose there because of me. Yeah, sorry, Michael, you've got to bear in mind, though, that I know nothing about the third eye and, you know, the power. I am just delving, you know, I'm just touching cloth with this uh, paranormal yeah. stuff. Um, but uh, so so you you can you can actually channel this. So essentially, when you're going into your mind's eye, a lot of people will find this in meditation but there are many people walking around with this thing fully open where uh esp usually i think happens in around the pineal gland so it's it, it is associated with esp and clairvoyance um 
in a very heavy way, but you can use it as, as a remote viewer. Uh, you can use it to, for meditation to you know see yourself in different light. You can use it for healing. But the mind's eye essentially is this concentrated, in my interpretation, is this concentrated uh, field in respect to the chakras, okay, and the energy points in the body. Uh, the mind's eye, if you are clear with that, you can see everything on the other side. You can see things that are happening in life. You can see potential possibilities, future and past. Um, and yet anything else that comes in front of you on any vibration, you can see it. But that also plays into your own vibration and where you're standing in that respect. But uh, yes, so through meditation, and I realized this is because it was knocking on that door very heavily and kept coming back into my vision, so to speak. How do I put this? All right, let's say you saw something really traumatic, okay? So you say you saw somebody get hit by a car. And you watch this happen, your psyche, you know, drinks it in. And as you start going on your next day, the day after, you can't shake this image of, of somebody getting hit by the car. And just, whoop, no matter what you do, it keeps coming back in front of your head. And you see it. You literally see it. You go, God, it's similar to that. Especially in, in the respect that I'm sharing now where it was a, a more negative uh, impact on, on me. So this thing kept coming back. So again, again, eventually I went into the meditation. I quieted my mind, tried to do my best to quiet my thoughts. But because it was already there, it was waiting for that opportunity because I had asked for it. Um, that's how I had to confront it. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I was nervous. Uh, I was scared because I actually knew at that point what was in front of me. I had contacted the other guy. I said, listen, uh, we went to Rutland and we did a whole episode and, uh, you know, sound like something came from the tunnels. And now I feel like I have an attachment. You know anything about that? He started laughing. I said, wow, you're laughing? He goes, yeah, well, I actually had to get that off another investigator eight months before you guys did that. Uh, but... He must have been hungry if he came all the way from the tunnels up to the root cellar. I'm like, oh, great. Great. <laughs> I followed all the rules and he still came. But, you know, again, that was that was of my accord. That was good. You got rid of it. I did. It, but it didn't initially just leave, like sometimes happens. This one actually backed off. And it stood behind me for another couple of months. Never really come in too, too much closer, but it, it stood and it watched me before it finally decided to turn around and go. Uh, that's the first experience. The second experience uh, was also with a non-human entity. Or maybe it started as a human entity, but this one was uh, had a feminine energy to it. I don't know why. Um, so several months after this happened, I decide that I want to go on another ghost hunt with a different outfit who kind of convinced me, well, I got this great graveyard. We're just going to go to a graveyard. What's, you know, what, what can be in the graveyard? Come on. I'm like, okay, fine. So we go out to a graveyard in Douglas, and we actually went out with like five or six people. Well, at the time, I didn't realize one of the girls that had come with us was somebody who had been possessed and had exorcisms earlier in life as a result of it. Now, that would have changed my mind to go out to something like this without some sort of control, and we, we I didn't know that. So... I go out there with my guys, and like I said, three or four other people come. Um, and this graveyard is very old, and it, but it's pretty small. And you're walking around, but outside the rock wall that line it uh, is very, very, very dark. It's unnaturally dark. Even though it's pitch black outside, it seems darker out there. And as soon as I'm looking at this, one of my guys goes, hey, we need to go out there. I looked at him and I said, why do we need to go out there? He goes, because there's something over there. I said, yeah, that's exactly the reason I'm not going over there. He says, yeah, but aren't we supposed to? I was like, listen, let me break into this. You know you know what I've gone through. Let me just ease into this. I'm not trying to find something else going to follow me home. So he says, okay, all right. So at this point, I have the camera out, and I'm filming. And um, I'm filming the far side of the graveyard. And as I'm doing this, I'm starting to notice motion out of, the, out of my eye, because I I actually, I don't have one eye closed. I have, have both eyes open, because it's dark anyway, and I want to be able to see what's going on while I'm looking through the lens, too, with the night vision. And <clears throat> so, excuse me. <clears throat> this is killing me, dude. Sorry. Um, I'm watching this, this motion out of my left eye, and I'm like, what the fuck? So I kind of pull the camera away, and I notice... 
what looks to be a pair of, of feet and legs kind of moving. And as soon as I focus on that, and I'm like, wait, oh, those are feet. It disappears, and it goes into legs. I'm like, those are legs. And then as soon as I see that, it goes into the torso, and then the arms, and then the head, but nothing all at the same time. It's just bits and pieces I'm seeing. And as I'm realizing this, there's other ones moving around and bustling like it's a whole town. And yet it's incredibly silent, just like the other time. Devoid of noise. Not just silent, devoid of any kind of vibration like that. And as soon as I realize this, I look back into the camera, and I see this bit of what looks like uh, little bubbles of light. I can't tell you, maybe 10 feet away from the camera. All of a sudden, whoosh, like this. They come right at me, go through me. At this point, I fell back. My buddy Chris was there this time, as I mentioned. He caught me. Push me back up. He goes, you okay? And what the experience felt like is if you fall back into a pool of water and you let yourself sink and you see the bubbles floating up to the surface while you sink down, that's what this energy looked like as it came out of me. So it went in, back out. And I was like, wow, what the hell? I, I, I couldn't wrap my mind. I had to sit down, uh, take some breaths, and eventually got back up, continued the investigation in which... Uh, some of the kids decided to do sort of like a little circle around one of the graves they believed was the last witch buried in Massachusetts, last woman who was accused uh, of being a witch. Yes, exactly. I don't know how uh, accurate that is, I'll be honest with you. I haven't been back to that place since, so I haven't been able to research it. So I reluctantly joined hands to do this, knowing it was a dumb idea, but I did it anyway. So we all get ready to leave. And we start walking down the path, and one of the kids says, who doesn't, you know, one of the regular guys who never comes, and it's never there, he's like, I don't feel good. And somebody else is like, yeah, I don't feel right either. And then we all kind of look at each other, because we were all thinking the same thing. Something's following us. So we turn around again, we're like, you got to stay here, you know, white light surrounds us, blah, 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 can't come with us. And uh, we had to do like a little, a little session there, if you will, to kind of cleansing session. So we all get in our cars, and we go... I'm like, okay. It was back in 2010, I think. Go home. Felt odd, but not like time before. And uh, so the next day I wake up, I have a podcast to do, and I'm actually going to cover that show or the uh, investigation on the show that we did uh, the day prior. So I do. And it ends around 11, 30, 12, 30 at night. I had some people on that were there talking about it. And, um, I step out of the kitchen, and I'm like, all right, I'm kind of hungry. I'm going to have a bite to eat, and I'm going to go to bed. So sure enough, I start cooking the spaghetti, and I get this wave of energy behind me. Like, just stood straight up. Something came right up on top, like right on top of me. Every one of my hair stood straight up. Back of my neck, I could feel it in my throat. There's this ball, and I said to myself, no, fuck no, 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 no. Put the fucking spaghetti down, fork over here, grab a cigarette, went out on the porch where it didn't follow me. And I sat out there, I'm like, wait a minute, what's going on here? Fuck. Okay, I finished up my cigarette. And as soon as I walked back in, it was like walking into water. It, the air was so thick, I was walking right into whatever the hell this thing was, just sitting there waiting for me at the edge of the porch door. I get back in there, immediately uncomfortable, immediate anxiety. And I'm like, ah. To the point where, like, my stomach is now turning so much, I'm not hungry anymore. I, I put the spaghetti away, put the fork in the sink, said, fuck it, I'm going to bed. So I get into bed, and I'm really uncomfortable. And I look over, we saw VCR, a little light. I see this movement, shadow, going back and forth. And I'm like, huh. And all of a sudden, I start feeling the bed shake. Like this. And I'm like, what the fuck? And I'm thinking... Well, it's going to be waking my girlfriend up at the time. You know, she's sleeping right next to me. And I said, all right, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to kind of ignore it, see if it goes away. It was like vibrating. Then uh, as I turn over, one by one, start pulling or pulling on or pulling out one hair at a time on my head. I'm like, what the fuck? So I turn over the other way, and now the bed starts vibrating even harder. Now, all right, yes. I am frightened at this point, but I don't really know what to do other than to try to ignore it, okay? So I turn over again, and I look over to my left, and I start seeing these little bubbles that went through me. I see them, and they're now coming together, 
And as they come together, there's something getting bigger and bigger. And I realized the thing's trying to fucking manifest in front of me. I said, nope, absolutely not. And I got up, went out to the porch, smoked another cigarette. Came back in. Thing was still there. I laid down, said to myself, I at least have to go to sleep. Uh, I, I can't let this keep me up. So I was just getting to that point where I was allowing myself to settle, even though some of the activity was still going around the room. And I was hearing noises like marbles dropping and everything. And I heard in my right ear, Michael. Everybody at that point had known me as Quincy. I think my girlfriend at the time knew me as Michael, and that was it. Okay, and she was fast asleep. Nobody else in that state knew who, what my regular name was, my real name was, other than my employers who weren't whispering my name at 3.30 in the morning next to my bed, you know. That was the last fucking straw for me, dude. Uh, I actually got up and didn't sleep at all that night. And from that point on, my health started to deteriorate. Uh, my cognizance began to deteriorate. I was training for a new job, and I was walking around with what felt like somebody had a knife to my neck like this. And I'd be going about my day doing this, just knowing, hey, I could, I could pull this across, and that's it, dude. The, the feeling is there. The dread is there. And, again, it was just it was so heavy. And, again, my health was failing. I wasn't feeling well. Relationships were starting to get rocky. Well, crazy. I'm not surprised you, you, you left your girlfriend in bed with, with, uh, with a witch. <laughs> <laughs> the well, the witch thing is, well, the odd thing is I asked her about that, and she said I never felt a thing. Never saw a thing, never felt a thing. I was like, oh, you were in the same bed and the thing was shaking like this. You didn't feel anything. She's like, no. So that's odd. You know, sort of we've heard of this sort of thing where somebody can experience something in a certain space and right next to you sharing the same space, that person doesn't feel the same thing. It's very odd. Uh, so long story short, I carried this with me for, I'd say about another three months. And... I had a two-hour commute to and from work, so I had four hours to drive every day to think about this shit. And um, one day, I just it just clicked with me. I was like, I got to face this again. Something came back for me from the freaking graveyard, and I got to face it again. Damn it. So I was actually driving this time. And again, it was just like right there. Whoop. And it was this big, evil-esque-looking looking thing. I don't even know what to call it. It was nothing I'd seen like that prior prior to it or since uh decayed emaciated intensely full of this dark hatred it's really hard to describe but there's a lot of feeling involved with it and again this one was asking not even in in a verbal sense it was just a feeling like what do you want you called what do you want and this time i handled it a little bit better than i did the first time around and i kind of had an idea i was like okay listen my humblest apologies. I contacted you with the intention to have a conversation about X, Y, and Z or whatever. I intended to do it at this location. I did not have the intention of bringing you along with me. I'd like you to return to your rightful place and where you belong, where you will be in your natural state, and I will continue and so forth. I had to go through this whole thing that it just kind of came out of me. And again, this one also came back for a little bit, maybe a day or two, and then went. Where the other one was there for probably another month or two. Uh, in the background, but I was not bothered by those two again. Wow. So, this, these, these beings, no, they're not, well, they're not, whatever they are, um, entities, um, spirits, dark spirits, light spirits, they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. Even in my home, Absolutely. And the reason for this, I very much understand and believe this, this thought, okay? Everything exists in the moment. Everything exists in the now that ever will exist or can exist. It's all existing in the same space at the same time on different vibrational levels. So that makes sense, okay? If you can imagine that in a respect, that every single one of these vibrational levels offers a different experience of being. And yet they all coincide with each other. Now, the thing that separates us from these other dimensional uh, places, if you will, is our awareness of them, our awareness of ourselves and what our capabilities are in terms of perception. You can train yourself to become aware of these. You can become more sensitive in that respect. But everything exists 
right now. So anything you've ever done in any life you've ever lived is being played out at this very moment. Very interesting concept to think about. That it's all happening now. And you can influence that uh, as a result of it all happening right now. So you could change your future. You could change your past. You could change a past life. For example, some people think deja vu is uh, a future self saying, hey, listen, I tried that and, and it gave you this result and this is how it made you feel. Why don't you try something different? You know what I mean? So you're delving into, well, not delving, but you're interested in ufology as well because you're looking at channels that talk about ufos where in your in your opinion do ufos come into all this is there a link between aliens or what we believe are aliens to the paranormal world absolutely and as time goes on i'm seeing more and more of a synergistic existence between the world of ufology and the paranormal. Uh, as I mentioned before with you, Ollie, uh, this used to be a more compartmentalized field 30 years ago. You'd have UFOs, you'd have you know aliens, you'd have ghosts and spirits, you'd have demons and so forth. None of it really, nobody really kind of brought it all together. But today, I think you're seeing a lot more of that occur. Um, one of the reasons, in my opinion, is that a lot of ETs have already mastered the art of traveling through those different vibrations and even shapeshifters uh native american or other indigenous cultures they have this knowledge of magic to be able to shapeshift but it has to do with vibration and uh, of course then coinciding with dimensional vibration um so if you're able to understand that so for example if i was able to let's say that my hand and everything around me uh vibrates at x okay as a variable if I were to, well, that being said, can't put my hand through the bottle because it vibrates at an overall frequency of X as, as does my hand, okay? Again, simplifying this. If I was able to make a, an electromagnetic field of sort, or some sort of field that with inside this bubble, my hand now uh, vibrates at X plus one or X minus one. It's now existing in the same space. You may not see it, you may see it. Either way, I'm gonna be able to go through uh, uh, matter. I'm gonna yep. be able to do that. So, I mean, that's the simplest way that I try to break it down when, when people ask these that, that question. Uh, but this because is the I think aliens. Sorry. Go on. Sorry. What were you going to say? Because I think aliens and extraterrestrials have been using these interdimensional uh, spaces as travel routes, or they exist in that space. That answers my question, because the question I have is, you do, do you think they're aliens? Oh, God, yes. Uh, to so me, it's not a thought. Because some people say that you know they are not aliens they are demons i think there's a little confusion because some of these ets that we come into contact with are not benevolent uh at this point i would not say the majority is like that. i'd say the majority are benevolent but because they have an interdimensional component to them they can visit you in the same respect and they can do uh their nefarious work is the same way as perhaps a, a non-human entity or a demon would. So basically they tap, tapped into the technology that spirits use. So is that kind of what you're saying? Well, I believe extraterrestrials as a whole, if you want to look at it in this way, yes, they're technologically advanced, but they're also incredibly spiritually advanced. Uh, what direction they've taken that is really up to them, uh, whether they're using it for you know, a good purpose or a bad purpose, so to say, is really dependent on the, the species and what their aim was, you know, at, in the beginning. But that being said, they're, they're not only involved in a technological sense, which is a, what a lot of people focus on, uh, but they're very emotionally and spiritually evolved as well. Yeah, I read an article, um, difficult because I'm dyslexic, but I did read an article <laughs> a long time ago, and it was talking about, which it was probably bullshit, but it was talking about one uh, an alien that they captured at Area 51 that mm -hmm. revealed something about the fact that it wasn't scared of death because it it knew that it was going on to something else. I can't remember the article I read that in, but it was really old. I think I was about 21 or something when I read that. I'm 40 this year as well. I know, I don't look it, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, it was... Um, I that kind of even though I thought this is probably crap that I'm reading, I thought mm. you know that would be amazing if 
if aliens actually knew you know the secret to life after death they knew what it was all about they knew the secret to life it's my understanding that they they very much do they have better uh tactile sense on that than we do and i believe that the concept of death the way that we realize it is more of a human construct i know that might be a little strange to, to some people out there but hear me out with this okay if you get to a certain point of evolution where you realize that we are all one that there is no separation from the energy from which you came from uh and this individualized experience is is literally a divorce from that illusionary divorce from that energy just to be able to look back and reflect upon yourself you know if you have that knowledge and you're now living that knowledge you're going to realize that of course if nothing else yeah there's other realms of existence yes there's other uh you know ways of life that can be lived um i mean some people argue with you that a rock has consciousness because it's associated with the earth and it carries that vibration i mean there's a lot to look into in that respect and if, if life itself is infinite the, the possibility of creation is infinite, then yeah, then why would you be afraid of transitioning from one to the other? I'll be honest with you, I'm not afraid of death either. You know what scares the shit out of me? The prospect of suffering to get to the point of passing over. That's what scares the fuck out of me, dude. Not the fact that we're going to cross over and maybe do something else. Yeah. It's it's suffering, you know what I mean? But I think death is a, is a concept in this respect. It's more geared towards uh, a human perspective then it is something globally shared as a fear i'm the globally i'm sorry universally shared as a fear yeah because i've always you know you hear about our uh, disclosure and you know people people won't be able to handle disclosure and i mm. always wonder if if that would be if it would have like a, a a religious um effect where you know people's beliefs would be just shattered you know it, it, maybe they'll they may find out that you know it is all just science and there's nothing after death there is nothing spiritual about this but the more and more and i was telling you this before um we actually started the interview the more and more i've delved into the subject of ufos uh, extraterrestrials i keep finding myself coming back to the subject of the paranormal you know and the spiritual level I wouldn't class myself as spiritual at all, but I only know what I feel. You know, does that make sense? It does make sense, and that goes in line with you know your personal path and what you've chosen to do here, and the agreements that you've made to give you the experiences that you've decided you wanted to have. Um, you can always stray outside of that. You know, that's the beautiful thing about being in this playground. It, a lot of it what we forget about, but sometimes innately do, is is have the play aspect of it. So. When you talk about going into the field and, and doing paranormal stuff, there was an element of play. Oh, we're going out on an adventure, you know what I mean? But, you know, there's another side that is very dangerous and yet needs to be respected. In terms of the ET phenomenon and, you know, spirituality, again, they to me, they go hand in hand. And something that we mentioned uh, before the show, and this has actually been brought to my attention more recently <clears throat> with uh, John's interview that you had where he has had contact or alleged contact with ETs, uh, maybe even an abductee. Um, either way, he's experienced some really heavy paranormal events that, again, when you talk to people who are associated with uh, abductions or have had relations with ETs in any way, they find this complete fluctuation of energy going on around them in the paranormal sense <clears throat> and they may have never have been involved or interested in the paranormal in the first place but there's that element too and i'm not sure why exactly but it's there yeah i think i think john's is more paranormal i think he maybe had i think he had an interaction probably with maybe he was abducted who knows you know i think what mm -hmm. happened to him was I don't think it was a dream. I've spoke to him a few times about it. You know, he's he's sworn blind that he wasn't drunk. You know, yep. he's, he, something went on and he did see grey figures. He saw the figures that everybody else reports. Now, whether these figures are the aliens or they're something to do, something more paranormal, I do not know. But I would say John's story... He may not even think this right now, but I think his story is more paranormal than Alien. It may be. It may very well be, Ollie. And that's sort of the interesting 
thing that we're kind of looking at as we're moving forward with his story, uh, he's actually shifted a little bit away from the ETs. And in my own thoughts, uh, I have... All right, so yes, I agree with what he's uh, been going through, and I believe that he believes he's gone through that. Um, him capturing the physical evidence of certain things is, is a, a new beginning for him, and that's really going to open things up for him in a positive way. I know it is. Um, but prior to that, maybe that one brush with the ETs is all he really needed. And again, maybe just being in the presence of something like that will open something inside of you, and you'll be more perceptive of those more subtle energies around you. He talks about shatter figures, too. You know, every one of us could sit here and say, well, I've seen some shit out of the corner of my eye. When I looked over there, it wasn't there anymore. Or I saw, I thought I saw a figure or, you know, whatever, and it's not there. Um, majority of people experience those subtle vibrational overtones, we'll say, okay, uh, dimensions that are all around us and the things that exist in them, but they're just not aware of it. Maybe coming into contact with an extraterrestrial gives one more of that boost to be aware of it. You saw that you were in the chat with uh, the interview I did with uh, David, and he discovered my channel through the interview with John. Mm -hmm. And he he thinks John's... Uh, what's happened to John is very much paranormal. Now, mm. he's, he's... As you saw in the interview, he's, he's researched, he's paid to go see people like Travis Walton. You know, he spent time with... Um, umpteen different people and to try and find out where this subject of ufology fits within the paranormal world um but he he did say something that you said and he said this to me offline he didn't say in the interview which you said about seeing the little twinkles of light mm -hmm. like so i it's weird. I never really spoke about this. I spoke about this. Me and David spoke about this private. But when I was a kid, I once woke up and it was from a, a fever, and I felt weird for for days. And I saw twinkles of light all in my room, everywhere, but they were red. And when I said they were red dots, uh, David said that's not good. Um, no, what's that? <laughs> but he 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 explained the same dots that you saw the little white ones to it like kidding. Twinkling. yeah but this was in a private conversation so i find that very interesting i do as well and it's those consistencies that i keep talking about on my show that you know gather between people's experiences that i'm really paying attention to the consistencies mean more to me than a one-off incredible experience like travis walton as yeah. much as I enjoy his story, and I believe that that's what he went through, okay, or at least a majority of what's described is what he went through, uh, the, the consistencies are more important for where we're moving forward uh, as a whole, a collective, a, a humanity, if you will. Um, people are looking for those, I think, even more so when the evidence itself, the physical evidence, doesn't hold or it doesn't show. Okay, you're going to go back to your innate feeling. How do I feel about this subject? You know what I mean? The feeling and the intuition that we all have and that's growing within each of us every day is our best tool to measure anything in the paranormal world. We, using gadgets to go out in the field, such as uh, recorders, EVP, um, EMP, whatever, you know, whatever you're using. Not EMP, that's electromagnetic pulse. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> Don't be using that. Yeah. <laughs> Don't try that home, no, no, no. no, Especially not if you're here. watching my show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but that being said, to me, at this stage of the game, I really feel using that sort of technology is, again, in the realm of play, and yet it's very archaic in its approach. Um, it's like getting just a visceral glance at it when you have the ability, of, with a little discipline, to sit down, quiet your mind, and open yourself up. And believe me, most people will find what they're looking for in doing that kind of thing. Even if you have trouble meditating, um, there's ways to open yourself to that sort of experience without having the technology. But again, everybody wants that physical piece of proof. But what happens when we get to a day where physicality is not as important and we're not as reliant on that? What do we have then? So speaking about meditation, you know, we're on the subject of, well, you're on an alien channel, um, but we're talking about the paranormal. We're talking about meditation. We're talking about the third eye. 
What are your thoughts on Stephen Greer? Okay, so Greer is somebody who has a lot of information. And I think that he, as an individual, has done a bit of soul-searching in respect to uh, what he talks about. Uh, obviously, he was you know, part of the CE5 uh, and, and that book and the demonstration that, that he stands behind heavily. <clears throat> now, you know, I, I've talked to somebody, this Big Cat actually had mentioned that yeah, the yeah, AA yeah. handbook has a lot of these same spiritual principles that the CE5 has. Now, that's significant because it was written in the 50s. And, you know, obviously having a spiritual connection, uh, you know, is going to help people get through some you know darker times but it's odd that there's a connection between what's written in the aa handbook and the ce5 stuff in terms of meditation and you know getting to your core you know bring yourself back to that balance that oneness of sort okay i'm, I'm using different words than perhaps the aa handbook has used but it's in there it's just the concepts are the same so my thought on stephen greer is that he has a lot of knowledge um I'll be honest with you, I don't know how the guy walks around so seemingly comfortable with what he knows and what he's experienced. Uh, so he's got some hell of, hell of protection somewhere. He's got a hell of a lot of protection somewhere to do what he does. But then again, some people are here to help raise the conscious consciousness level of the planet and the people and everything around. So your specific mission, for example, Nicole Tesla was a great one. Okay, but he did it through technology, and unfortunately, he didn't get to see that, and we're still struggling with that now, but we know the extent of his inventions and what he was able to do and, and the significance of that. You know, In my opinion, he came here to do just that. Uh, Stephen Greer is somebody who has a mission to raise consciousness. Now, when you get down here, of course, ego can get in the way, and yeah. I don't think that Greer has a bad ego. I'll be honest with you, all of us have an ego, you know what I mean? But yeah, oh, it definitely. can be a... a a more negative thing or it could work for you or against you and in, in Greer's case I I think he's pretty balanced in that but um, I, I listen to him I listen to what he has to yeah, say Yeah, I, I give him a lot of shit because I like to take the, the piss a little bit out of him um, <laughs> just just because some of you know I it, it, I think it's the whole cost behind everything that he's doing you know you can come out on the beach I'll show you some UFOs just give me twenty thousand dollars and you know yeah you know I, I'll pay for the food you know we'll have we'll, I'll have some wine it's fucking twenty thousand dollars yeah man no you, you know it's, I, it's, I it's, it's expensive um maybe I should set up a GoFundMe so I can experience a day with Greer. Listen, oh. I'll tell you what, for $20,000, I'll put you through something that made you feel like you were in another planet. You know what I mean? It'll cost you about 500 bucks. Now, here's the, here's the point. As I mentioned earlier, uh, energy exchanges are important, but you need to make it fucking fair, dude. You can't be charging. I mean, what was her name? Uh, it brought you Sui Reiki to um, the United States from Hawaii. She was charging an astrical, astronomical amount of money for uh, these Reiki attunements. And, and for what, dude? This is something we all should know, okay? Again, it takes money and time to set up a public event. Uh, let's say it costs you $10,000 to have, you know, 150 people at this event. You charge each of those people what it would cost, you know, dividing that $10,000 up, okay? And then maybe another half on top of that, you'll make the money back and you'll have a few extra bucks to put towards the next event, eat, feed your family. $25,000, yeah, I mean, dude. I, the twenty thousand dollars. I don't know where that came 000. from. It may not be twenty thousand dollars. I, I oh, either way, yeah, thousand dollars <laughs> somewhere. Um, don't get me wrong. And Stephen, if you if you are a big fan of Alien, and I do, which I know you probably are, um, I do like Stephen Greer. Don't I actually do like the guy. I just it's the whole, and I get that you've got to you've got to make money. You have to make money. You know, I I've got a Patreon page. I that's that's. That's my way of getting the Patreon page in. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I've you've got to make money if you want to do that as a for a living because you love it because you love the subject. So I get what he's doing there. It's just sometimes, I mean, I watched the guy interview that oh, that young guy that was talking about raiding Area Fifty One. I've forgotten the the guy's name, but he interviewed him. Uh, in fact, me and Rich were watching. I think we're watching it together and we're both commenting. Um, but it was like he was interviewing the young chap that was that tried to organise the raid on Area Fifty One. But then he just started to speak about himself. Uh, <laughs> you know, all the way right. through it. Like, 
Let the guy. That's that ego. Yeah, saying that I'm doing that now. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. That's that ego. Uh, you know, I mean, it's you know, a public figure like Greer, he has to know how to speak to, and you have to know know how to pace yourself. And you know, when you're interviewing, there's an art to that, of course, as you know. Um, you I can't don't. get carried away. No. <laughs> You know it innately, brother, because you, you do it, all right? Even if you don't know about it, you do it. I watch you. Um, but there's a pace, there's a timing, and, and a point to jump in over somebody, and there's a point to come in during the silence. You know, and if you're in there talking about yourself, you know, it's, <laughs> I don't know. It's a little uh, ostentatious, I think, in its, in its way. But I still like Greer. I still like him. And again, yeah, like you said, you got to make money. I respect that. Uh, you know, but do it the right way and don't overcharge people for what it is. You know what I mean? What's the end here? If you had all the money in your world and you didn't have to work, okay, of your own accord, what would you do? I would still do the same fucking thing I'm doing right now because I still, I pay for this. You know what I mean? I don't make any money off my channel. Well, and a lot of make- people gave it shit, but I really liked Unacknowledged. I really liked that. I thought that was great. I think that's the best one he's done. I, I enjoyed Unacknowledged. Um... But so, so while we're on the subject of UFOs, mm-hmm. have you seen any? Have you had, I had any two experiences? Two experiences where I, I couldn't tell you what I saw in the sky, uh, and these aren't as long-winded as the other one there, but I'll give it to you. Um, so I think it was about seventeen, between seventeen and nineteen years old. Uh, I was in this house that I'm at now. We're right on the beach overlooking Long Island Sound, which, if you were to follow straight out, you'll get Montauk uh, there as well. So over across the way here, I have, well, you know what? Oh, no, you won't be able to see it. Maybe you will. Hold on. Let's see. Oh, yeah. yeah, right up the tree line there. Okay, so I walk over to the door. It's over here, and I'm shutting up for the evening. And it's about 2.30 in the morning. Uh, Normal night for me as a teenager. And as I'm shutting the door, I see this really bright white light just hovering above the tree line. Now, out here... You know, over by the ocean, you can see a lot of the sky. It's very clear, <clears throat> excuse me, for what it is out here. Plenty of stars. Uh, this one just was way too close. And my first initial thought was, is that a helicopter? Because it was so bright. But there weren't any blinking lights that I could see. It was just this big, bright ball. So I kind of walked outside and I listened. I didn't hear anything, but I'm still watching it. So I got back inside and I'm looking out, out the window. And I notice as I'm, I'm staring at it that... In the middle of this white light, there's this band, thin band, it's colored. And as I'm looking at it more, I see, you know, blue, red, green, yellow, so forth, and it's spinning. It looks like it's rotating in the middle of this white ball of light. I'm like, oh, well, that's weird. And there's a, uh, a submarine base over there, a very, very well-known submarine base out of Groton, Connecticut, uh, that I think it had was in that vicinity, uh, you know, in terms of how high, high, excuse me, how high it was above the tree line. That's what I'm guessing. Okay, and so I said to myself, "Well, I need to get the camera." You know, I, had, I knew there was a video camera in the next room. It was a high eight tape, and I was going to go and grab that and film it. Uh, and in my head, I felt, or I heard, it wasn't like this crazy voice or anything. I said, "You know, if you turn around, the minute you come back to look, it's going to be gone." And I was like, "Ah, all right." You know, so I entertained the thought for a moment. <clears throat> excuse me, and. So I stood there and, and watched it for another, like, five, seven minutes. At that point, I was like, all right, it's still there. I see it. I've been standing here for, like, 10, 15 minutes now. I'm going to go and get the camera. So I ran over, grabbed the camera, looked out the window. It was gone. Okay. All right. Once. You got me once. Okay. So the, the second time I, I saw something I couldn't identify in the sky, uh, I was in Manchester, Connecticut, uh, it was just after I got out of college. I was in my recording studio doing some editing, and my folks uh, had gone out for the evening to grab a bite to eat. So they left about 10 minutes later. I get a telephone call from my mother. She says, uh, you know, why don't you look outside? You know, your window, you, there's something weird in the sky. I said, what do you mean? So we had the landlines back then, so I'm on the phone. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm like walking and pulling the freaking cord, see if I can get over there to take a look out the window. And uh, sure enough, up in the sky, there were three lights they were completely motionless, just like the other one I saw. They're just completely motionless, no movement at all. And it was just sitting there in a triangular form. Huh. Same exact fucking thing. I'm looking at it. Wow. I'm watching it, watching it. I should go and get the camera. This time it's literally on the other side of the wall. <clears throat> I just have to kind of crawl over and reach around, grab it, and I'll be able to film it. 
Same thing in my head. I'm thinking to myself, it's probably me saying it, saying, hey, you turn around, that's going to be gone. So I sat and watched it. Again, same amount of time, about 10, 15 minutes, I'm standing there looking up at the sky watching this anomaly. Never seen anything in, in the sky before or after, just like that. Okay. Finally, I make a decision. I'm going to get that camera. So I quickly crawl around. Within five seconds, I grab it, I turn around, it's gone. But how did that happen? I Literally, three lights, right? How did that happen? Twice. Twice. So next time I'm, uh, you know, well, these days we have cell phones on us. We have cameras on us. We didn't have them back then. Uh, I will not be leaving <laughs> next time I see something like that in the sky. Yeah, but they know we've got cameras. Yeah, they do. They sure as shit do. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, it, it, and I always I always think if they want to be seen, you know, they'll, they'll let you see them. Mm-hmm. The minute they, they, they know, oh, that's enough. They'll do whatever they do to disappear. I and honestly, I don't quit. That, no, that, that's the thing. I actually do think that these, they know when you're watching them. I would agree with you 100%. They're aware of the fact that you're going to watch them before you even decide you're going to watch them. Uh, you know, I, if these beings are telepathic in nature, okay, they're not using vocal expression and moving airwaves to create communication. They're doing it on a telepathic level. They're 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 light years ahead of what we're doing right now uh, in terms of that esoteric progression. Um, they've evolved. Yeah. I almost think that it could be, and I have this kind of like uh, in my head. This is why I imagine. Well, well, it's nowhere else. It's not going to be in my balls. Um, <laughs> but I, I got this this feeling that it's almost like when you see them it sends they receive like maybe a, a signal so it's not mm-hmm. they don't know you're there but if you see them they get a they 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 they, they would get a signal almost like you know like a, a satellite signal or whatever but they they get the signal from us to say we've been seen mm-hmm. we need to piss off right now it's get out of here. Or we'll actually stick around for a little bit. And see see what this guy does. See if he gets his camera. You know. It's very you. possible. It's very possible, Ollie. I'll never rule anything out until, you know, shown otherwise. Um, you know <laughs> So, you know, in other words, you think maybe they you know, we could be as much as an experiment for them as they are for us in in a, in a respect. Quite possibly, yeah. Yeah. Quite sure, possible. why not, man? Yeah. Why not? So we've been going for about an hour and 40, but before we okay. get going, because I, I definitely would like to get you back on again sometime. More because than happy. I'm delving a little bit more into this paranormal world. When I know more, I feel a bit more confident. Get somebody like yourself on. It might be I'd like to get possibly some a few guys on together, maybe a couple of paranormal guys with a couple of just hard-hitting science UFO guys that you know don't kind of it would be interesting to have the debate you know with yes. the two sides i think that'd be quite in with me with me just in the middle just going like that you know <laughs> <laughs> it's coordinating coordinating <clears throat> but that would be awesome tell everybody where, where where they can find you um what your mission is what your goal is to get out of what you're doing so I'll start off by saying uh, my mission, my goal here in doing what I'm doing is to bring about awareness uh, in an educated and grounded and intellectual sense as well as intuitive to help people be informed about the paranormal world, extraterrestrials, and the realization that our consciousness is rising and that this is something that is offered to every single one of us at this time if we so choose to have that. Uh, my mission is to bring this in the most unbiased way but Sprinkle it with entertainment and comedy at the same time because laughter really is the best medicine. I'll, I'll be honest with you. It, it's, uh, it's a beautiful thing. Now you guys can find me over at YouTube on uh, Dark Hour Paranormal. As Ollie mentioned, it is Dark Hour itself is one word. Paranormal is its secondary. Uh, if you put the space in there, it's, you know, it won't find me apparently. I, I just no, realized no, within the last week. Not. Yeah. Uh, so I'll work on I'm that. Getting the algorithms. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ollie. I appreciate that. But yes, Dark Hour Paranormal on YouTube. You can reach me at uh, Dark Hour P on Twitter. Uh, I also have Instagram as well as uh, Dark Hour Paranormal, and that's basically to kind of just let people know what's going on with the show and the broadcasts. But 
Yes, you can also email me at quincypelkyellen at gmail.com or darkhourparanormallive at gmail.com, whatever you like. Also, you'd be getting... Um... I'm going to call him my little project then, but he's not my little project. He just told me his story, and it's kind of, it's kind of, it's, it, Johnny's getting about now. Um, yeah. So John's going to come on your show? Yes, he is. He should be on in the middle of September, along with, uh, I have another really great guest coming up, uh, Elisa Madhus from Channeling Eric, where she channels her, uh, her deceased son. And she's been doing this for many years with different mediums. And we're actually going to do a session on the show, which is new for Dark Hour Paranormal in terms of actually having a real channeling session. And I'll be I'm, I'm really excited to be a part of that because um, she picks some very clear individuals to represent the other side. And her son comes through with incredible consistencies time and time again. And they talk about every fucking thing you can imagine. Nothing. Nothing is taboo when it comes to uh, asking questions to Eric. so But yes, John will be on in mid-September. As I've mentioned, he's been talking to you, Rich, and myself, showing us a lot of his evidence. I actually have a video to watch uh, after the show with you here that I promised him I would. And, yeah, uh, you to watch so You got well. the same thing. <laughs> yeah. so. I'm, um, I don't know if it's that, now's the time to... Yeah, I, I'm sure John will be fine with it. I'm, I'm doing a vlog, a John vlog, uh, which cool. I will be editing. So basically, John's going to be, he's filming his life over the next three months. And I'm going to put it together. And then John, I'm going to help him get his channel up and running. So then he can carry on with it on on his own. That's awesome. Because I know that's something he really wants to do. And he's feeling very motivated to go this path and he feels like he's being pushed into something you know better with what he's doing now so i appreciate you helping him do i really yeah do. he's a different man from when he if you i mean if you watch the interview well, well you've watched the interview but if you if you watch my interview and then you go watch him on uh rich giordano's goof on radio i'll just goof on now cause he, um <laughs> yeah. and then you watch him on your show when he comes on i'm i'm sure people will see that the guys are He's a like a different guy. You know, day. He's got a, he's got a little bit more confidence about it. Now he's starting to venture yes. more into it and trying to find answers. Yes, he is. He's changing very rapidly, uh, and I'll let him kind of explain that transformation. You know, in a, in a public forum, I won't. I won't say his words because it, it's just incredible what he's been doing uh, personally along this journey. And all it took was for him to finally say yes, to make a decision, to without him even realizing it, stop living in fear over the events that he was experiencing, whatever they were, uh, and start looking at this in a more positive light and talking about it, releasing that energy. And you gave him that first chance, dude. And for that, I appreciate you. Well, I had, I had to ask him twice. I know. I yeah, know because he, he said no. He said he didn't want <laughs> to come. Know. The first time he said, I don't want to come on. And then he, he, he thought maybe he wanted to blurt out. And then he said, I said, he said I actually, no, he's fine. I'd rather, it, you know, it. I'll, I'll come on. Uh, just don't put my picture in the thumbnail. Um, no, but yeah, I don't think your mum's going to watch Alien Addict. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? I thought of that too, yeah. <laughs> That's but funny. Now he's kind of like, he's he's delving in the idea of maybe t telling people close yeah. to him and doing just, it of his own accord yeah he's, I mean, he's just told his best friend so that's amazing that's i love watching this guy open up man it's actually i'm i'm really i don't like to use the word blessed but i think you guys know what i mean i'm very blessed to be able to <clears throat> watch him blossom into what he's becoming it's so positive man it's yeah so positive. He, he did say in a, in a message, he said, between, he says, between um, Michael um, and Rich and myself, it's just three people he trusts in this. Yeah. So, and I think it's good that he's got, like, my side that kind of, you know, I don't know where I'm going with it. You know, I'm just kind of like an, an in-between guy that is just curious about the subject. There's yourself with the paranormal. I know Rich has delved with the paranormal quite a bit in his past. Um, 
but also he he's very much into the UFO stuff. Um, I think it's interesting. I think John's John's journey. I think it's just begun. It's just begun, and it's just so I'm so excited for the dude. Uh, I'll be honest with you because he's really diving head first into this. But you you hit the nail on the head saying that there is this nice balance between the three of us. Rich, you know, again, he has a little bit of the paranormal, but he's very UFO oriented and he's very good with analysis. Uh, then there's yourself who has extensive experience interviewing. I don't know about you, you know, in terms of your personal life or experiences yet, but there's a possibility that you've had experiences with that. I'm, I'm sure that there's a reason that you were you know guided Probably. to work with him. Yeah, there's there's this stuff. I'll speak to you about offline about that, but there's yeah. stuff in, in my past that's that's make makes me intrigued about this subject. But yeah, uh, Michael, um, Dark Hour Paranormal, thank you so much for coming on the channel, and we'll get you on again. Probably get you on actually with John and Rich. That would be that quite would be fun. A, that'd be that'd be a good uh, little interview. Uh, but That's yeah, awesome. thank you so much for coming on, guys. I will leave all the links below uh, for Dark Hour pa Paranormal's channel. Um, check them out, and uh, yeah, thank you, my friend. Thank you, brother. Night, I appreciate folks. it. Thank you. Mind the books, don't mind.